Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. It's the first time we've gotten together uh, in the new year. Uh, I know a lot of uh, things happened in 2019. We said goodbye to some folks we hated to lose. Uh, we did have some good things happen, too. Uh, so it was kind of a mixed year. It'll be interesting to see what 2020 brings with uh, all that's going on here in our town. The, the next GYC conference is also going to be in Indianapolis. So for those of you who weren't able to go this year, next year it's right here. So... Uh, and for those of you on the board, that means no hotel expenses. So, you know, good for us, too. Um, it was great to see the younger folks that are still here today. Jane, thank you for your song. I have my B-I-B-L-E right here. And it will make you bold and brave. So thank you for sharing that song with us. All right, today we're talking about uh, making all things new. And, uh, of course, you saw the text was from 2 Corinthians uh, 5.17. Therefore, if anyone in, is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that's going to be the theme throughout what we're going to talk about. I know that usually I inundate you with a lot of uh, scriptural references. If you look in your bulletin, I tried to make it a little bit easier for you by actually giving you an insert. where It's going to have most of them. They're not all listed on here. Um, but you can kind of follow along, fill in the blanks, and you'll have access to the scriptures there. Uh, I have also put the slides from this presentation on our Facebook page. Uh, well, there's a link to the slides, not the slides themselves, so you can access it later if you need to go back and look at something because uh, you don't get to write it down. And then uh, before we go any further, just bow our heads one more time for a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together to worship you on your holy Sabbath day. And as we entered into this new year and we read your promise to make all things new, Lord, we ask that you will send your spirit to be with us, Lord. Renew us so that we may reflect you to the world. We thank you for asking these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So I want to start off a little bit about New Year's resolutions. How many people have made, it, made a New Year's resolution this year? Just two, three, four, five? Okay. Now, how many have broken it already? <laughs> Thank you for being honest. All right. I made a New Year's resolution, and by the end of this service, you're all going to know whether or not I kept it. It was to give shorter sermons, so <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But why do we make New Year's resolutions? Well, a New Year's resolution is a decision to do or not do something to accomplish a personal goal or to break a bad habit. Um, most people, they kind of focus on making a bad, uh, breaking a bad habit. I almost said making a bad habit. Breaking a bad habit. That's a big one. You know, people want to stop smoking. They want to uh, watch what they eat. Uh, some people say they just want to get healthier, which means they're going to stop doing some of the things that make them not so healthy. And it always comes at a time when people look back at the past year and make an effort to improve themselves as the new year begins. So now, is there anything wrong with that? Right? How many people are satisfied with your performance last year in most areas of your life? Right? I'm not raising my hand because I'm completely satisfied with how I did. I'm just, you know, feel free to raise your hands. Only one or two brave souls in here. Most of us are not satisfied with how we did in the last year, and we want to do better. Right? And that's just normal. If you don't want to do better, then you're probably dead. Right? In psychology today, we're going to look at why New Year's resolutions fail. Now, keep in mind, we're going to put a scriptural spin on all of this uh, before we're done. But number one, the goals aren't clear. Right, so if you say, I want to be healthier, is that a clear goal? No. I want to get closer to God. Is that a clear goal? No. Now, is it a good goal? I mean, do you want to get closer to God? I hope you do. You need to be a little bit more specific. Do you, do you know where your goals come from? Right. Why do you want to make that goal? Why are they important to you? If you have a goal that's not important to you, you need to rethink it. Because if it's not important to you, you're not going to hit it. Right? And how would achieving this affect your life? Voice from on high. 
right? So it's important to think of those things when you're making a goal. Another reason we fail, we feel overwhelmed, right? Uh, how, how many people have ever made a goal to lose weight, right? How many of you set that goal say, I'm going to lose 100 pounds, right? That's overwhelming, right? Losing 100 pounds. I've lost 100 pounds, right? Uh, that was a sermon I gave a couple years ago. I'm not going to put that picture up here, all right? Uh, and that, pit, that sermon is not on Facebook. You can't look it up. So, <laughs> But uh, that was not how I started, right? My first goal was I said, I want to lose one pound this week. Now, can you lose one pound? That's reasonable, right? Not overwhelming. But if you look at the big goal, like if you're sitting here, I'm a terrible, sinful person, right? I have just done all kinds of bad things in my life. And my goal is I want to preach the Word of God and bring thousands to God. Well, that's going to be overwhelming, right? That's going to be very overwhelming, right? And other things, you may not know where to start. When With my goal, my goal was I started, I want to lose one pound. What do I have to do to do that, right? Another reason that you may feel overwhelmed, you may feel pressure to accept the status quo. I say if you uh, are trying to give up smoking... Right? And you work with a bunch of people who smoke, and you've been there for years, and you have a hat on your brakes. You all go out back, and you smoke, and you talk, and you chit-chat. Well, what's going to happen? You're trying to quit smoking, and they all go out there, and they're your friends. You're used to going out and chit-chatting with them. Right? Well, you may try to go out there, but you're going to be overwhelmed because you're going to be bombarded with all these uh, friends who are doing something you're trying to stop doing. Right? So that... Peer pressure can be a big deal. Uh, And then the goal may not seem achievable. It may be unachievable. Or it just seems that way. Uh, Again, the the goal to lose 100 pounds seems pretty pretty massive. Let's say you want to get out of debt and you're in debt up to here. Well, that's pretty massive. Maybe you should start off with, I want to pay this bill. Or maybe just get to where I'm paying my bills on time. Uh, Something like that. Something smaller. You may feel discouraged. You may be impatient due to a lack of visible progress. This happens a lot with people who are losing weight or trying to lose weight because they make their goal. They're not clear. They get on the scale and that needle hasn't moved or even worse, it's crept up instead of down. Right? That's discouraging. Right? You may be too rigid in your approach and become blinded to possibilities to attain your goal. Right? That's a big one, especially if you think about the one I mentioned earlier of getting closer to God. Right? So maybe you're just being very rigid in your approach and God may be saying, hey, you know, here's something you should try, but it's too, you, you don't want to do it. It's just not something you've done before and you just don't want to give it a try. So keep an open mind and don't be too rigid in your approaches. And then I believe this is the last one. You're not ready to change. Some people make a New Year's resolution because... They think it's the thing to do, but they really don't. They're not serious about it. They really don't want to do it. And, uh, and that's going to lead to failure. They don't thoroughly consider the corresponding what, when, where, why. Uh, and it causes them to lack the ability to ask themselves if they're truly ready to change. Now, when it comes to that relationship with God, right, you've got to be willing to open yourself up to Him and ready to allow him to make those changes. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. Okay. Now back to the scripture references. John 3.8 says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So what's that text is telling us? The Spirit's going to come in. It's going to work on you, and it's going to make those changes which are going to be visible. It's going to be something you're going to be able to recognize. You may not see the Spirit coming, and you may not know how it's doing that, but it is the Spirit that's going to make those changes in you. The Spirit is working in you. I like to say here, uh, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So you're basically being reborn or made new. We're going to read more from that chapter in a little bit. So while the work of the Spirit is silent and imperceptible, its effects are manifest. You can see what it's, what it's doing. 
If the heart has been renewed by the Spirit of God, the life will bear witness to it. So if the Spirit is moving on you, you're going to see changes in your life. So a lot of times if you have something in your life you're trying to change, and the reason you're not successful may be because you're trying to do it on your own. Right? You can't do it on your own. We're going to get into some text to back that up earlier or, or later. Um, the wit, the uh, Spirit will give you the power to make those changes. Zechariah 4, 6. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the, Lord, of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor power, catch that, not by might nor power, not by your own human strength, right? but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Right, you remember who Zerubbabel was? We, we read about this last quarter when we were studying about uh, them going back, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the walls in Jerusalem. And uh, he was saying, you're not going to be able to do this without me. Now, in Luke chapter 11, we're actually going to have to turn to the Bible here because I don't have this printed up on the screen. Verses 9 to 13, we read about a gift. And Jesus is talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. about that. Leaned on the button. Being sensitive. All right. Was that me? Yeah, that was me. Okay. Luke 11, verses 9 to 13. I hear pages turning. That's good. I'll give you all a moment to catch up. Still hear a few. All right. So we read, it says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, we're talking about the gift of what? What's the gift? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit right? And where does it come from? God. God. <laughs> and how do we get it? Ask, right? It takes action. Jesus clearly indicates the Holy Spirit is a gift from God and cannot be earned. There's nothing you can do to earn it. It's a gift. He says. However, we do have to take action. If you look at that text, six times it tells us to ask, two times seek, and two times knock. There's a lot of action, a lot of uh, verbs going on there. So you have to take action. You can't just sit here and say, well, I'll get busy when the Spirit comes to me. You've got to get busy doing the things to, to ask for the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is God's greatest gift. The gift which brings with it, uh, brings all the other gifts with it. We've heard about the gifts of the Spirit. Right? If you want the gifts of the Spirit, you have to have the Spirit. It is only given to those who express their desire for this gift and appreciate it. He's not going to send the Holy Spirit to somebody who doesn't want it, right? If you're not willing to accept it, why should he give it to you? Well, how is that willingness or that commitment expressed? There's a few things. Actually, there's quite a few things. First one is the yearning for God. And this is in John chapter 3, or excuse me, chapter 7. I got chapter 3 on on my brain today. John chapter 7. Verse 37. Must be rubbing against my jacket. Pull it down. We'll see. All right. Uh, John 7, verse 37. On the last day... 
that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Have you ever been really thirsty? Really thirsty. Yeah. Ever, ever been out in the desert? Right. All right. I've been out in the desert. When I was in the desert, it was the middle of winter. It, was, it wasn't too bad. But I did a stint working as a roofer in the summer in uh, the Asheville area, Asheville, North Carolina. And when you're up on the roof, it could get to be 115, 120 degrees. And there's no water fountains on roofs. For some reason, they just don't build them there. Right. So uh, I can tell you. I have gotten thirsty, and, when, and it becomes your sole focus. I have got to get something to drink. You have to yearn for God that way. You have to have that desire. Right? And then if you go in the very next verse, we talk about the next thing, trusting God. In verse 38, it says, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So he who does what? Believes in me. Now, how do you express belief? Right. You know, if you're uh, in a burning building, you're up on the fourth floor, and there's a f- group of firemen down below, and they've got one of those rescue nets, and they're yelling up there, Jump! We'll catch you. You believe them. How do you show that belief? You jump. You do what they say, right? You, you uh, obey them, right? You, you trust them. Okay. Next thing. Commitment is expressed by complete surrender as a result of trusting God. This one is a little tough. Especially in our Western culture. We have a problem with surrender. Let's look at Romans 12.1. I actually preached a sermon on this text not that long ago. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, when it's talking about presenting your body a living sacrifice, you know, what's it talking about? You know, it's a living sacrifice, so he's not telling you to go out and, and kill yourself, right? He wants you just as you are. Right? A lot of people have the idea that, you know, well, I, God can't take me right now. I'm not in any kind of condition. Right? I'm all dirty. i got some bad habits. Let me take care of these bad habits, and then God can do something with me. And I'll come back. People say, well, you know, I'm not ready to be baptized. Right? I, I've done all these horrible things. I says, I've got to, I've got these uh, desires. I'm still tempted by things I shouldn't be tempted to. Let me get rid of those temptations and then I'll be baptized. It doesn't work that way. Jesus wants you to surrender as you are right now. Give him your problems. Give you your weakness. Right? And then he will give you the power that you need to overcome those things. Commitment is expressed by following God in everything. Here's another area we struggle with, especially especially in our Western culture. Acts 5.32. Acts 5.32, yep, there it is. And we are His witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who, what? Obey Him. Does God expect you to obey? Yeah, now is obeying always easy? No. No, it's not. It's not always easy, right? Obeying is not. We want to do things our way. Right? We think we have the answers and we know what's best, right? But God's, God doesn't work that way. He says, you've got to do it my way, right? And if you do, he, says, he sends his spirit. It says right there. He sends his spirit. Uh, one of the big issues when we've been, we've been studying Revelation, um, and if you haven't seen the uh, videos we have on Facebook, I think we've got 21 done now. We're doing chapter 18 today. But a big issue at the end is obedience. God says, I want to be worshipped in a certain way. Those who do so 
God protects in the last day. He sends his spirit. He gives them power. Those who don't end up getting the mark of the beast and some bad things happen to them. We studied the plagues a few weeks, uh, a few weeks back. Uh, you don't want any part of that. So obedience has benefits. This one's a little comp- complicated. It says, give up their own way, go God's way, and do this according to God's will. Let's go back to Acts 2. And here it's talking about Pentecost. If you remember, before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, what did the uh, disciples do? They all came together, right? They prayed, they asked for the Holy Spirit, they worked out whatever issues there were between them. By the end of that time period, they were unified under that one purpose. But it says here in Acts 2.38, and this is when Peter was, was preaching to the crowd. It says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the key word there is repent. What does repent mean? Do what? Surrender? Okay. To repent, you have to change. You have to turn away from your sins, right? Turn away from that life. Go a different direction. Right? And to, to be totally honest, what it's telling you to do here, you have to make that decision that you want to turn away from that. Once you've done that, He gives you the power. He sends the Holy Spirit to give you the ability to turn away from that. So he's not telling you that you have to break all those bad habits first. You just have to be willing to allow God to help you break those bad habits. And this last one, this is an interesting one. Not to plan anything wrong. This one kind of surprised me, but it's, it's a little obvious once you read the text. Psalm 66, 18. You know, all the other ones were from the, uh, the New Testament, but here we go to the Old. Psalm 66, 18. And it states, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So if you have some cherished sin, let's just say, or some... Uh, some vice you're just not willing to give up. You say, Lord, you can take all these other things, but, you know, I, I, I can't give up this, whatever it is. Then he's not going to be able to hear, he, well, not, not that he's not able to, he's not going to send you that spirit. If you're holding on to something because you're just not willing to give it up, you're telling God, this is more important to me than the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? You've got to be willing to let everything go. And then God will give you the ability to do so. And this one probably should have gone towards the front of the list. Realize and admit our great need. We go back to Luke 11. I should just leave my glasses on. Luke 11, verses 5 through 8. And he said to him, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on this journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs." Now, he's talking here about the friend. The friend realized that he did not have anything to give to his visitors. So he went and asked. We have to realize that we don't have what we need to make these changes in our lives. And we have to go ask God for that. He will give it to us. And it does say that you have to be persistent, right? He wants you to, to continually ask. And that's the next part here. Continually ask for the Holy Spirit. We've already read this verse, uh, Luke 11, 9 through 13, where it had asked six times, seek twice, and knock twice. It's a continual process when you ask for the Holy Spirit. It's not one and done. Right? We all know that when you make that surrender at baptism, 
It, the, the baptism in water is a symbol. It's a symbol of you giving up your life and receiving the Holy Spirit, being baptized in the Spirit. Right? But in order to continue to receive that Spirit, you have to keep asking. You need to surrender daily and ask for God to send His Spirit on you daily. And He will continue to do so. Right? The struggle is we, give, we may overcome some of these problems. We may make these changes and we give it up. How many people know someone who lost 30 or 40 pounds and looked really great, felt great, and then six months later they're right back where they started? Seen that? Right? That's because once they achieved the goal, they were done. Right? Yeah, I ate well, I exercised for six months, I got myself now, I can go back to doing what I wanted to. Right? And usually uh, a sign that that's going to happen, they lose all that weight, they keep all their old clothes, right? Because they know what's going to happen, right? When, when I started losing weight, I would go down, as soon as I got down, a belt size, or not a belt size, a, a pant size, all the old stuff went to Goodwill, out of the closet. So if I was going to gain weight, that meant I was going to have to go back and buy new clothes. And I'm a poor person. I can't afford to go out and buy new clothes. So... That forced me to be honest. The same thing here. Right? You have to continually ask. Right? Romans 12.1. We read this already, but it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And again, he wants you as you are. Don't feel like you have to change beforehand. You just have to be willing to change. And he will take you. And he will work in you. So why is surrendering our lives and making a commitment to God important? Why is it important? Why can't God just change you? It's choice, right? We all have free choice, right? You have to choose. You have to choose God. You know, God wants to save everyone, right? He doesn't want anyone to perish. But we know that in the end times, most of the world is going to make the wrong choice. We've got all the warnings. God has paid the price for every person who ever has lived and ever will live. Right? So the only reason anyone's going to perish is because they choose to do so. So no deep-seated love for Jesus can dwell in the heart that does not realize its own sinfulness. The soul that is transformed by grace of Christ will admire his divine character. But if we do not see our own moral deformity, it is unmistakable evidence that we have not had a view of the beauty and excellence of Christ. And that's uh, another sign. If you want to know, is Christ working in you? Right? Is the Spirit working in you? When you look at yourself, do you see yourself as a holy and righteous person? Or do you see yourself as a sinful person who cannot do it on your own? If you truly have Christ working in you, you're going to see your flaws. Right? It's going to work like a mirror. It's going to show you your flaws and then he's going to start polishing that up and, and removing those. The less we see to esteem in ourselves, the more we shall see to esteem in the infinite purity and loveliness of our Savior. A view of our sinfulness drives us to him who can pardon. So the more truly we see uh, Jesus, the more truly we'll see our own sinfulness, and that'll just drive him to him, right, to make those changes. And when the soul, realizing its helplessness, reaches out after Christ, he'll reveal himself in power. The more our sense of need drives us to him and to the word of God, the more exalted views we shall have of his character and the more fully we shall reflect his image. And that should be your goal, is to reflect his image. Yeah, I still used to uh, say, you know, my goal is I wanted to go, I wanted to be a soul winner. But can I win any souls? Do I have that power? I do not have that power, right? There's only one being who has that power, and that's God. But can I reflect Jesus to other people so that they will open up and be willing to accept him so that he can save them? Yeah. I can have that kind of influence, right? I can do that. I think I mentioned uh, in church, well, maybe it was in church, or it might have been in Sabbath school a week or two ago. I don't remember. Right? I can't 
force people to make a change. I can't force them uh, to accept God, but I can be an influence, right? And uh, I have, uh, I work in a secular environment, and you have to be careful what I say. I can't go evangelizing at work, but people can tell by the way I live and the way I talk and uh, from the things I talk about that I'm a Christian and there are a fair number of them who will come up to me and ask me to pray for them. Right? If they have a sick family member, they'll, they'll say, hey, can you pray for, here's what's going on with Uncle Joe. That's just a name. Uh, some of them watched his live stream, so I know not, that no one's ever asked me to pray for their Uncle Joe, so I'm safe. But, um, but they'll tell me what's on, going on, give me some details, and ask me to pray for them. So that's a positive influence. You can have that kind of influence. Now, am I going to save that person? Not me, but if they're opening up to have me pray for them, they're opening up to God so that God can work for them. John chapter 3, checking the time, see how I'm doing on my resolution. (laughs) We're doing good. All right. John chapter 3. Now, this is a uh, chapter that we're all well familiar with. This is, remember, uh, Nicodemus comes to talk to Jesus. He comes by night in the garden because he doesn't want the other Pharisees to know what he's doing. Because he's curious, but he's not committed. Right? Curious, but not committed. Right. So it says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So born again, right? So that's a new birth, being reborn, made new. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, and there it's talking about baptism, right? In the water. And the spirit, spiritual baptism, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So we can stop right there. So God has a spiritual kingdom that he has set up. If you want to be a part of that spiritual kingdom, you have to be baptized or born by the spirit. And then he goes down a little bit further. Uh, I'm going to skip down here a little bit. Talks about, of course, uh, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's saying that he paid the price for us. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. So if you want to be saved, there's only one way. You have to be saved through Christ. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And verse 19 is, is important here. It says, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in who? In God. Right? So when the Spirit is working in you, you're going, the, the works are going to follow. Right? You don't do good works so that God will send the Spirit on you. Right? You develop that relationship with God. You develop that closeness. You ask Him for the Holy Spirit, and the good works follow. Right? That's how that works. But what keeps us from surrendering to Christ? It's really what it's all about. What keeps us from surrendering? What did verse 19 say? Verse 19 I just read it, but if you had your Bible, you can look down and read it. Take an answer from the congregation. 
It says men loved what rather than light? Darkness. darkness. All right, I had to prompt you a little bit on that one, right? Men love darkness rather than light. Why do people find it so hard to change and give up bad habits? They really like that habit, right? Which are some things I just don't understand. I have a lot of friends at work, get into the secular environment, and they talk about uh, how they're going to go out drinking. And their idea is to drink so much they don't remember anything and they're going to be sick as a dog the next day. I don't understand that goal. I don't. Uh, I don't see what's fun about that. It, it doesn't appeal to me at all. Uh, but they, they evidently, to them, that's, that's something they just don't want to give up. Okay. And then John 15 talks about staying surrendered. So surrendering is important. And just as important, once you're surrendered, you have to stay surrendered. John 15, and this is, talks about the true vine. We're not going to read all of this because, again, my resolution, shorter sermons, right? Verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now understand, if you're bearing fruit, the Holy Spirit's working in you, you're doing on good things, God's going to prune you. So you're not perfect yet. So he's going to come and he's going to reveal some more changes that you need to make. He says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now, what does it mean to abide? It's to stay with him, right? Or how many married people we have in here? You abide with your wife or your husband? I hope so, right? I hope so, right? right? You abide with each other, right? You uh, live together. You share things in common, right? You make uh, adjustments. You want them to be happy, right? We've all heard the saying, happy wife, happy life. Right? Amen. It's a true saying. It's a true saying. Keep that in mind, right? Recently married, right? <laughs> Secret to success. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. So, yeah, you abide with each other. You spend time with each other. Right? And verse 6 says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. So if you don't abide in Jesus, if you don't stay committed, what happens? You're, yeah, you're out. You're, you're of no use. You're, you lose the ability to do anything for the kingdom of God. Now, does that mean that he wants to cast you out? You choose to be cast out. Right? You made that decision. That was your choice. Right. So no partial surrender. I just had to show this quote. I ran across it. I really liked it. It's from Morris Vinden. There's no such thing as a partial surrender. It's no more possible to be partially surrendered than it is possible to be a little bit pregnant. Has anyone ever met anyone who was a little bit pregnant? Yeah, you, you're not. You either are or you aren't. There's no, no, no middle ground. Right? So I just love that quote. Had to share it. So you're either surrendered or you're not. Right? So if you have some little thing that you're cherishing, you're just not willing to give up, you are not surrendered. Right? And as long as you hold on to that, God is not going to send that spirit on you because you're not ready to accept it. He's not going to force it on someone who's not willing to surrender. Okay. Revelation 3, 20, 21. We're almost done. I'm excited. Looks like I'm keeping this resolution. Revelation 3, 20 to 21. So you start reading this, I know you're going to recognize it. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. So it's talking about their what? He's going to abide with you, right? You open that door for him, let him in. He's going to abide with you. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So what comes before the overcoming? You have to open the door, right? 
You have to let him in. Let him come in and abide. We all see the, the uh, picture. You've seen the picture of Christ knocking on the door. And the person's inside. And their house is a wreck. They don't want to let him in because they're embarrassed to what's going on in there. I think they need to modify that picture because we see Jesus in the robes and all that. But if you take a look, a real good look, I think a more accurate picture. Jesus got an apron on, got a broom and a dustpan in one hand, feather duster in the other. Maybe got some cleaning gloves. And behind him is a, a wagon loaded with cleaning supplies. He's coming to clean house, right? He's not just coming to visit. He's coming to clean house. So why do believers, people who call themselves Christians, leave Jesus outside the door? Why does that happen? Any ideas? Wrong choice. Wrong choice? Okay. Well, yeah, it, leaving him outside is definitely the wrong choice. Right? He can't clean you from outside. Well, let's take a look at Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a man of God, right? He was a spiritual leader in Israel. But he did not understand the process. He had an intellectual knowledge of the scriptures, but he didn't know the author. Another reason, cost of discipleship is too high. Matthew 19, 16 to 24 tells us about the rich young ruler. Remember the invitation Jesus gave to the rich young ruler. He invited him to be one of his disciples. He says, come follow me. Walk with me. How many people would have loved to have walked with Jesus during his ministry? Would that not have been awesome? Right? How many of us would have had the same issue the rich young ruler did? Because Jesus said, give up all your worldly possessions. Come follow with me. And think about what he's passing up on. What he's saying is, you know that little house you have over there and that, that money in the bank? You don't need all that. Come with me. you got riches in heaven. Right? you got a mansion in heaven. I don't care what your house looks like here. It is nothing compared to what's up there. Right. So for some, the cost of discipleship is just too high. Right. They're afraid of what they're going to lose. And they're not thinking about what they're going to gain. Now this one we are going to look at. The reward of surrender, Matthew 16, verses 24 through 27. All right, Matthew 16, 24 to 27 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself... Take up his cross and follow me. So if you're going to follow Jesus, do you have to give something up? Yes, you do. The good news is, it's nothing you really want to hold on to. Once you compare what's going on. Verse 25, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So he's talking about here, whoever desires to save his life, whoever desires to keep this earthly life and all the trappings that come with it, is ultimately going to lose his life. Everything here is temporary. Nothing lasts. But if you're willing to give up this life here, give up the trappings to go with this life, then you're going to receive a better life. You're going to receive eternal life. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Can you purchase a soul? Anyone in here have that kind of wealth or power? No, we don't. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his work. So when's the reward? That's talking here about a reward at the second coming. When Jesus comes the second time, he's bringing his reward with him. However, there is also an immediate reward. Jesus says he came that we should have life and have life more abundantly. He wants you to have a better life now. But the ultimate reward is in the future when he comes back at the second coming. So the big question here is what is keeping you from surrendering? We looked at some of the options. Have you truly weighed it out? Have you thought about it? If you haven't, I'd encourage you to do so. Right? What is holding you back? Is it something that you're struggling with giving up? 
or you just feel like you're too imperfect, right? You've messed up. You've made too many mistakes, right? If that's keeping you from surrendering, don't let that keep you from surrendering any longer. God knows your mistakes, right? He knows your failures. He loves you anyway. He wants to give you the power to overcome those things. This is actually the last slide I have. Uh, I would encourage you, if you're thinking about surrendering and you're really serious about asking the whole, for the Holy Spirit, there's a little book, Steps to Personal Revival. We bought copies for everybody in the church. Not everybody has taken one. I don't think we've done a good job of promoting it up here, but we still have about 35 or 40 copies they're in the book rack by the front doors. So if you haven't gotten one already, I'd encourage you to pick one up today before you leave uh, and read it. And when you're done reading it, read it again. And if you really have it down, read it one more time just to make sure. And then once that's done, pass it on to somebody else so that they can benefit as well.